How to Succeed or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune by Orison Sweat Marden. Chapter 7 Foundation Stones In all matters, before beginning, a diligent preparation should be made. Cicero How great soever a genius may be, certain it is that he will never shine in his full luster, nor shed the full influence he is capable of unless to his own experience he adds that of other men and other ages by bolingbroke it is for want of the little that human means must add to the wonderful capacity for improvement born in man that by far the greatest part of the intellect innate in our race perishes undeveloped and unknown by edward everett if any man fancies that there is some easier way of gaining a dollar than by squarely earning it he has lost his clue to his way through this moral labyrinth and must henceforth wander as a chance may dictate by horace greeley what we do upon some great occasion will probably depend on what we already are and what we are will be the result of previous years of self-discipline by h p Lydon. learn to labor and to wait by longfellow what avails all this sturdiness asked an oak tree which had grown solitary for two hundred years bitterly handled by frosts and wrestled by winds why am i to stand here useless my roots are anchored in rifts of rocks no herds can lie down under my shadow. I am far above singing birds that seldom come to rest among my leaves. I am set as a mark for storms that bend and tear me. My fruit is serviceable for no appetite. It had been better for me to have been a mushroom, gathered in the morning for some poor man's table, than to be a hundred-year oak, good for nothing. While it is yet spoke, the axe was hewing at its base. It died in sadness, saying as it fell, Weary ages for nothing have I lived. The axe completed its work. By and by, the trunk and root formed the knees of a stately ship, bearing the country's flag around the world. Other parts form keel and ribs of merchantmen and having defied the mountain storms they now equally resist the thunder of the waves and murky threat of scowling hurricanes other parts are laid into floors or wrought into wainscoting or carved for frames of noble pictures or fashioned into chairs that embosom the weakness of old age thus the tree in dying come not to its end but to its beginning of life it voyaged the world it grew to parts of temples and dwellings it held upon its surface the soft tread of children and tottering steps of patriarchs it rocked in the cradle it swayed the limbs of age by the chimney corner and heard secure within the roar of those old unwearied tempests that once surged about its mountain life all its early struggles and hardships had enabled it to grow tough and hard and beautiful of grain, alike useful and ornamental. Sir, you have been to college, I presume, asked an illiterate but boastful exhorter of a clergyman. Yes, sir, was the reply. I am thankful, said the former, that the Lord opened my mouth without any learning. A similar event, retorted the clergyman, happened in Balaam's time. Why not allow the schoolboy to erase from his list of studies all subjects that appeared to him useless? Would he not erase everything which taxed his pleasure and freedom? Would he not obey the call of his blood, rather than the advice of the teacher? Ignorant men who have made money tell him that the study of geography is useless. His tea will come over the sea to him whether he knows where China is or not. What difference does it make whether verbs agree with their subjects or not? Why waste time learning geometry or algebra? 
who keeps accounts by these. Learning spoils a man for business, they tell him. They begrudge the time and money spent in education. They want cheap and rapid transit through college for their children. Veneer will answer every practical purpose for them, instead of solid mahogany or even paint and pine will do. It is said that the editors of the Dictionary of American Biography who diligently searched the records of living and dead Americans found 15,142 names worthy of a place in their six volumes of Annals of Successful Men, and 5,326 or more than one-third of them were college-educated men. One in forty of the college-educated attained a success worthy of mention and but one in ten thousand of those not so educated so that the college bred man had two hundred and fifteen times the chances for success that the others had medical records it is said show that but five per cent of the practicing physicians of the united states are college graduates and yet forty six per cent of the physician who become locally famous enough to be mentioned by those editors come from that small five per cent of college educated persons. Less than 4% of the lawyers were college bred, yet they furnish more than one half of all who became successful. Not 1% of the businessmen of the country were college educated, yet that small fraction of college bred men had 17 times the chances of success that their fellow men of business had. In brief, the college-educated lawyer has 50% more chances for success than those not so favored. The college-educated physician, 46% more. The author, 37% more. The statesman, 33%. The clergyman, 58%. The educator, 61%. The scientist, 63%. You should therefore get the best and most complete education that it is possible for you to obtain. Knowledge, then, is one of the secret keys which unlock the hidden mysteries of a successful life. I do not remember, said Beaker, a book in all the depths of learning, nor a scrap in literature, nor a work in all the schools of art, from which its author has derived a permanent renown that is not known to have been long and patiently elaborated. You are a fool to stick so close to your work all the time, said one of Vanderbilt's young friends. We are having our fun while we are young, for when will we if we not now? And Cornelius was either earning more money by working overtime or saving what he had earned, or at home asleep recruiting for the next day's labor and preparing for a large harvest later. Like all successful men, he made finance a study. When he entered the railroad business, it was estimated that his fortune was thirty-five or forty million dollars. The spruce young spark, says Scissor, who thinks chiefly of his mustache and boots and shiny hat, of getting along nicely and easily during the day and talking about the theater, the opera, or a fast horse, ridiculing the faithful young fellow who came to learn the business and make a man of himself, because he will not join in wasting his time in dissipation. We'll see the day. If his useless life is not earlier blasted by vicious indulgences, when he will be glad to accept a situation from his fellow clerk, whom he now ridicules and affects to despise, when the latter shall stand in the firm, dispensing benefits and acquiring fortune. When a man has done his work, says Ruskin, and nothing can any way be materially altered in his fate, let him forget his toil and jest with his fate if he will. But what excuse can you find for willingfulness of thought at the very time when every crisis of fortune hangs on decisions? A youth thoughtless, when all the happiness of his home forever depends on the chances or the passions of the hour. A youth thoughtless when the career of all his days depends on the opportunity of a moment. A youth thoughtless when his every action is a foundation stone of future conduct.
and every imagination a foundation of life or death. Be thoughtless in any after years, rather than now, though, indeed, there is only one place where a man may be nobly thoughtless, his deathbed. Nothing should ever be left to be done there. On to Berlin, was the shout of the French army in July 1870. But, to the astonishment of the world, the French forces were cut in two and rolled as by a tidal wave into Metz and around Sedan. Soon, two French armies and the emperor surrendered, and the German troopers paraded the streets of captured Paris. But as men thought it out, as Professor Wells tells us, they came to see that it was not France that was beaten, but only Louis Napoleon and a lot of nobles, influential only because they bore titles or were favorites. Louis Napoleon, the feeble bearer of a great name, was emperor because of that name and criminal daring. By a series of happy accidents he had gained credit in the Crimean War, and at Magenta and Solferino. But the unmasking time came in the Franco-Persian War, as it always comes when shame, artificial toy men meet genuine self-made men. And such were the German leaders, William, strong, upright, warlike, every inch a king, von Roon, minister of war, a master of administrative detail, Bismarck, the mastermind of European politics, and above all, von Moltke chief of staff who hurled armies by telegraph as he sat at his cabinet as easily as master moves chessmen against a stupid opponent said captain bingham you can have no idea of the wonderful machine that the german army is and how well it is prepared for war a chart is made out which shows just what must be done in the case of wars with the different nations and every officer's place in the scheme is laid out beforehand there is a schedule of trains which will supersede all other schedules the moment war is declared, and this is so arranged that the commander of the army here could telegraph to any officer to take such a train and go to such a place at a moment's notice. When the Franco-Prussian War was declared, Juan Molk was awakened at midnight and told of the fact. He said coolly to the official who aroused him, Go to pigeonhole number in my safe and take a paper from it and telegraph as they are directed to the different troops of the empire he then turned over and went to sleep and awoke at his usual hour in the morning everyone else in berlin was excited about the war but one Molk took his morning walk as usual and a friend who met him said general you seem to be taking it very easy aren't you afraid of the situation i should think you would be busy ah replied von Molk. All of my work for this time has been done long beforehand, and everything that can be done now has been done. A rare man, this von Molk, exclaims Professor Wells, one who made himself ready for his opportunities beyond all men known to the modern world. Of an impoverished family he rose very slowly and by his own merit. He yielded to no temptation, wise or dishonesty, of course, nor to the greater and ever-present temptation to idleness, for he constantly worked to the limit of human endurance. He was ready for every emergency, not by accident, but because he made himself ready by painstaking labor before the opportunity came. His favorite motto was, Help yourself and others will help you. Hundreds of his age in the Prussian army were of nobler birth, thousands of greater fortune, but he made himself superior to them all by extraordinary fidelity and diligence. The greatest master of strategy the world has ever seen was sixty-six years at school to himself before he was ready for his task. Though born with a century and an army officer at nineteen, he was an old man when, in 1866, as Prussian chief of staff, he crushed Austria at Sadova and drove her out of Germany. Four years later, the silent, modest soldier of seventy, ready for the still greater opportunity, smote France and changed the map of Europe. Glory and the field marshal's baton, after fifty-one years of hard work. No wonder Louis Napoleon was beaten by such men as he. All Louis Napoleons have been and always will be. 
Opportunity always finds out frauds. It does not make men, but shows the world what they have made of themselves. Sir Henry Havelock joined the army of India in his 28th year, and waited till he was 62 for the opportunity to show himself fitted to command and skillful to plan. During those four and thirty years of waiting, he was busy preparing himself for that march to Lucknow, which was to make him famous as a soldier. Farragut, the Viking of our western clime, who made his mast a throne, began his naval career as a mere boy and was sixty-four years old before he had an opportunity to distinguish himself. But when the great test of his life came, the reserve of half a century's preparation made him master of the situation. Alexander Hamilton said, Men, give me credit for genius. All the genius I have lies just in this. When I have a subject in hand, I study it profoundly. Day and night it is before me. I explore it in all its bearings. My mind becomes pervaded with it. Then the effort which I make the people are pleased to call the fruit of genius. It is the fruit of labor and thought. The law of labor is equally binding on genius and mediocrity. Fill up the cask, fill up the cask, said old Dr. Bellamy, when asked by a young clergyman for advice about the composition of sermons. Fill up the cask, and then if you tap it anywhere, you will get a good stream. But if you put it but little, it will dribble, 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 and you must tap, tap, tap and then you get but a small stream after all the merchant is in a dangerous position says dr w w patton whose means are in goods trusted out all over the country on long credits and who in an emergency has no money in the bank upon which to withdraw a heavy deposit subject to a side draft is the only position of strength and he only is intellectually strong who has made heavy deposits in the banks of memory and can draw upon his faculties at any time according to the necessities of the case they say that more life if not more labor was spent on the piles beneath the saint petersburg church of saint isaac's to get a foundation than on all the magnificent marbles and malachite which have since been lodged in it Fifty feet of Bunker Hill Monument is underground, unseen and unappreciated by the thousands who tread about that historic shaft. The rivers of India run underground, unseen, unheard by the millions who tramp about, but are therefore lost. Ask the golden harvest waving about them if it feels the water flowing beneath. The superstructure of a lifetime cannot stand upon a foundation of a day. C. H. Parkhurst says that in manhood, as much as in house building, the foundation keeps asserting itself all the way from the first floor to the roof. The stones laid in the underpinning may be coarse and inelegant, but even so, each such stone perpetuates itself in silent echo clear up through the pineal. The body is in that respect like an old Stradivarius violin, the ineffable sweetness of whose music is outcome and quotation from the coarse fiber of the case upon which its strings are strung. It is a very pleasant illusion that what we call the higher qualities and energies of a person maintain that self-centered kind of existence that enables them to discard and contempt all dependence upon what is lower and less refined than themselves. But it is a delusion that always builds in an atmosphere of fact. Climb high as we like our ladder will still require to rest on the ground. And it is probable that the keenest intellectual intuition and the most delicate throb of passion would, if analysis could be carried so far, be discovered to have its connections with the rather material affair than we know as body. Lincoln took the postmastership for the sake of reading all the papers that came to town. He read everything he could lay his hands on. The Bible, Shakespeare, Pilgrim's Progress, Life of Washington, and Life of Franklin, Life of Henry Clay, Aesop's Fables. He read them over and over again until he could almost repeat them by heart. But he never read a novel in his life. His education came from the newspapers and from his contact with men and things. After he read a book, he would write out an analysis of it. 
What a grand sight to see this long, lank, backwoods student lying before the fiber in a log cabin without floor or windows. After everybody else was a bed, devouring books he had borrowed but could not afford to buy. I have been watching the careers of young men by thousand in this busy city of New York for over thirty years, says Dr. Kuehler. And I find that chief differences between the successful and the failures lies in the single element of staying power. Permanent success is oftener won by holding on than by sudden dash, however brilliant. The easily discouraged, who are pushed back by a straw, are all the time dropping to the rear, to perish or to be carried along on the stretcher of charity. They who understand and practice Abraham Lincoln's homely maxim of pegging away have achieved the soldiest success. It is better to deserve success than to merely have it. Few deserve it who do not attain it. There is no failure in this country for those whose personal habits are good and who follow some honest calling industriously, unselfishly, and purely. If one desires to succeed, he must pay the price. Work. No matter how weak a power may be, rational use will make it stronger. No matter how awkward your movements may be, how obtuse your senses, or how crude your thought, or how unregulated your desires, you may, by patient discipline, acquire. Slowly indeed, but with the infallible, certainty, grace, and freedom of action, clearness and acuteness of perception, strength and precision of thought and moderation of desire. It would go very far to destroy the absurd and pernicious association of genius and idleness to show that the greatest poets, orators, statesmen, and historians, men of the most imposing and brilliant talents, have actually labored as hard as the makers of dictionaries and arrangers of indexes. And the most obvious reason why they have been superior to other men is that they have taken more pains. Even the great genius, Lord Bacon, left large quantities of material entitled Sudden Thoughts Set Down for Use. John Foster was an indefatigable worker. He used to hack, split, twist, and pull up by the roots, or practice any other severity on whatever did not please him. Chalmers was asked in London what Foster was doing. Hard at it, he said, at the rate of a line a week. When a young lawyer, Daniel Webster, once looked in vain through all the libraries near him, and then ordered at an expense of fifty dollars the necessary books to obtain authorities and precedents in a case in which his client was a poor blacksmith, he won his case, but on account of the poverty of his client only charged fifteen dollars, thus losing heavily on the book spot, to say nothing of his time. Years after, as he was passing through New York City, he was consulted by Aaron Burr on an important but puzzling case then pending before the Supreme Court. Webster saw in a moment that it was just like the blacksmith's case, an intricate question of title, which he had solved so thoroughly that it was to him simple as a multiplication table. Going back to the time of Charles II, he gave the law and precedents involved with such readiness and accuracy of sequence that Burr asked, in great surprise, Mr. Webster, have you been consulted before in this case? Most certainly not. I never heard of your case till this evening. Very well, said Burr, proceed. And when he had finished, Webster received the fee that paid him liberally for all the time and trouble he had spent for his early client. What the age wants is men who have the nerve and the grit to work and wait, whether the world applaud or hiss. It wants a Bancroft who can spend 26 years on the history of the United States, a Noah Webster who can devote 36 years to a dictionary, a Gibbon who can plot for 20 years on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. A marabou who can struggle on for forty years before he has a chance to show his vast reserve destined to shake an empire. A fair god, a wan mold, who have the persistence to work and wait for half a century for the first great opportunities. A Garfield burning his lamp fifteen minutes later than a rival student in his academy. A Grant fighting on heroic silence when denounced by his brother generals and politicians everywhere a field's untiring preservance, spending years and a fortune laying a cable when all the world called him a fool, 
a michael angelo working seven long years decorating the sistine chapel with his matchless creation and the last judgment refusing all remuneration therefore lest his pencil might catch the taint of avarice a titian spending seven years on the last supper a stevenson working fifteen years on a locomotive a watt twenty years on a condensing engine a lady franklin working incessantly for twelve long years to rescue her husband from the polar seas a thurlow weed walking two miles through the snow with rags tied around his feet for shoes to borrow the history of the french revolution and eagerly devouring it before the sap bush fire a milton elaborating paradise lost in the world he could not see and then selling it for fifteen pounds a thackeray struggling on cheerfully after his vanity fair was refused by a dozen publishers a balzac toiling and waiting in a lonely garret whom neither poverty debt nor hunger could discourage or intimidate not daunted by privations not hindered by discouragement it wants men who can work and wait that is done soon enough which is done well soon ripe soon rotten he that would enjoy the fruit must not gather the flower he who is impatient to become his own master is more likely to become his own slave better believe yourself a dunce and work away than a genius and be idle one year of trained thinking is worth more than a whole college course of mental absorption of vast series of undigested facts facility with which the world swallows up the ordinary college graduate who thought he was going to dazzle mankind should bid you pause and reflect but just as certainly as man was created not to crawl on all fours in the depths of primeval forests but to develop his mental and moral faculties just so certainly he needs education and only by means of it will he become what he ought to become man in the highest sense of the word ignorance is not simply the negation of knowledge it is the misdirection of the mind one step in knowledge says bulwer is one step from sin one step from sin is one step nearer to heaven end of chapter seven